Uh, welcome to this, uh, the third in our series of six um, seminars on ethics and the challenges of the 21st century. Uh, for those of you who uh, don't know, the Oxford Martin School is uh, putting these seminars on. And the Martin School is a, is a sort of a constellation of a number of different uh, scientific and, uh, and legal and uh, philosophical institutes around the university. Uh, that are all funded by, by the Martin School. And uh, today's speaker is uh, Professor Paul Kleneman, who is at the uh, Institute for Emerging Infections. Is that right? You're the principal investigator? One of them, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and also a professor of, of uh, medicine here at Oxford University. And he's going to be speaking to us uh, about the challenges of, of developing uh, vaccines for HIV and for hepatitis C virus. Um, so he'll talk for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion after that. So please uh, join me in welcoming Paul. Well, thanks very much. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit. Uh, we've got the sort of uh, the, the theme is based around viruses, and um, so I'm going to spend the first part of the talk uh, just briefly in setting the scene for uh, the kind of host virus interaction. Um, and then talk a bit about hepatitis C, which is what I largely work on, and then a bit about HIV, which throws up sort of parallel challenges, although slightly different ones. So uh, we've got a bit of both. Um, there's other work going on on other viruses. And these two are, are particularly challenging because they set up very long-term infections and affect very, very large numbers of people. So for those of you who are not um, uh, virologists or um, medics, um, you might ask, what is a virus? Um, even some medics might ask that. Um, so Peter Medawar, we, we work in a building called the Peter Medawar Building, um, and he had a very poor view of what viruses were, that they were a piece of bad news wrapped up in protein. I think, I think they can, they're better than that in many ways. We can use them to, to, to uh, uh, help us as gene delivery systems and so forth. Um, and also they're very, very smart. So um, they're smarter than we are, as I'll probably show you. Um, and viruses basically, essentially, they grow inside the body cells. There's some bacteria that, that use the, the host cells to grow in, uh, like TB, but um, viruses have to do this. So if you uh, take a very simple view, you can take a plate and streak, streak out uh, bacteria very easily if it's got the right nutrients. You can't do this with viruses. You need to grow them within a, a cell culture system. So just to give you an idea, a typical virus... This would be true for HIV, Hep C, pretty much all of them look the same. They've got these attachment proteins that they use, and that's very important in determining what we call the tropism of the virus. In other words, what cells it's going to get into, or more what host it's going to get into, and how they can swap between hosts. So everybody's had about flu transmitting between uh, uh, pigs and uh, birds and humans, and, and the, the issues about that crossing of avian flu, it's all dependent on these proteins. So, this is really a very key area of the battleground. And then you've got, essentially, a, a, the rest of it is, is all just a sort of packaging process, and you've got the viral blueprint. The viruses I'm going to talk about today, um, HIV and, and Hep C, um, use RNA as their template. And that's particularly important because that's not such a stable genome. And so that, that gives them an advantage in many ways because, unlike us, whenever they copy themselves, and they're copying at millions and millions of times per day, that they can, they can uh, introduce errors which lead to um, a template for viral evolution. So that's one of the reasons that these viruses are so successful. <coughs> and then they're, 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 they're packaged in a, an important area of a packaging protein which is hidden uh, inside the virus, but it's open to the immune system when it gets inside, as I'll discuss <coughs> in a minute. So one of the important things about um, viral immunology and, and trying to get, allow the host to get on top of the virus is just to get a sense of the, the mathematics behind it, and um, which I'm not going to talk about, but i just give you an illustration here. So a virus will come in and use its attachment protein to enter the cell, and then it will unpack at some point in the cell, and uh, this is all beginning to be get imaged at very, very high resolution now, but I think the concept is fairly straightforward. And then at some point it's going to uh, stop its kind of inward progress and start making the outward progress. So from one virion... It will, it will harness everything it needs. So some viruses um, take everything in with them, and others uh, uh, require a huge amount of cellular uh, machinery in order to uh, 
uh, get processed. Uh, the, the virus, I, I, my favourite virus is a, is a parvo virus. It's only got two genes in it that can infect 80% of the world's population, but it, it really doesn't bring in much with it. It relies entirely on the host. Whether there are other viruses which bring in huge amounts of machinery in order to manipulate this, like um, the herpes virus group. So then you get, the, the point about this is that from one incoming virus, you get very many exiting viruses. Not all of them are perfectly formed. When, they, when the viruses make the mutations, they can create uh, basically defective or dud viruses. But the numbers are overwhelming. So if you think about the incoming virus and what you've got to do is an immune response, you're up against a very, very steep uh, curve of uh, viral uh, replication. So the earlier you can get your immune response in, uh, the bigger effect you'll have. So if you're essentially, if you can stop the cell producing more virions, that's much more effective than trying to chase around and soak up all the virions that come along later. So that's really the fundamental uh, issue about the hep C vaccine, is just trying to get in early before the thing has really got going. This is a picture, I hope <coughs> people can see it, of HIV budding from a cell. It's very elegant. If you look carefully, you can see a little kind of um, tethered, this look like a hot air balloon trying to get away from the cell. And that is actually a cellular protein called tethering, which is trying to hold the virus back. So there, there's a lot of uh, processes that are going on through all this, where, where, the, where the host is trying to impose restriction on the viral uh, replication. And tethering is one ancient mechanism for doing this. And the viruses, as I said, they're smarter than us. And HIV has already or has developed or inherited mechanisms to, to, to interfere with tethering, so it can actually escape from the cell and, and disappear and, and infect new cells. So there's, there's a lot of, of the battleground is starts as soon as the virus gets into the cell and the virus forces its way out of the cell by evading all of this. But um, the cell doesn't necessarily die as a result, particularly in the case of hep C. We think that the cells can basically sit there and just churn out viruses for ages rather than necessarily dying as a result. You, people have a sort of imagination that it's alien, uh, the whole thing bursts forth and that the cells die. It's, it's not necessarily like that. So before we try and just understand what we're doing with the vaccine, here's just another little bit of very basic analogy. So you've got to imagine that your body is a basically Blenheim Palace. Um, and there's a fantastic party going on um, somewhere. I don't know if anybody's been to a party at Blenheim Palace. I don't know where they held them, but somewhere in there. And uh, the individual cells which the virus is infecting are essentially like rooms in, in Blenheim Palace. So they've all got their own little... A micro environment. So you've got the party, but and you want lots of guests to come in. So we're all getting exposed to foreign antigen, foreign uh, entities in the form of the things we eat or the natural flora that we carry. So we're 90% bacteria. So you've got to allow a certain amount of tolerance to all of that, and especially in the context of, of, of a party where there are guests coming in. But you want to exclude certain guests, in other words, these viruses. So how do you do that? That's the trick of the immune system, and, and that's the bit that the viruses exploit. So you've basically got a few bits of uh, security. Um, you've got the moat, which is um, a very, just a physical barrier, so, um, which is actually very important in the viral defense. The skin is the sort of wall of death for the viruses because the, the cells are, are dead, so they can't harness them for their own replication. You've got security, but security are uh, right at the back. They're not actually going to do anything immediately, and essentially you've got dogs, um, a set of guard dogs that are ready and waiting for unsuspecting people. So, so as I said, the skin's a wall of death, um, but I mean, you can't, you're not going to protect ourselves. We, ha we cannot clearly protect ourselves against all viruses just through our skin, and viruses often pick the easier route up the drive, or they're parachuted in. And, and the virus I'm going to talk to you about today, um, Hep C, we, we know there's uh, around about 170 million people worldwide infected, and that the hot spot of that, as I'll show you on the map, is Egypt. And in Egypt, the spread of Hep C is largely through medical interventions there. We, we got pretty good evidence that it was, in the last century, uh, efforts to eradicate schistosomiasis that, that basically parachuted Hep C into the system. If it had been left to its own devices, it probably wouldn't be causing such a problem there. So the dogs, just to give you some context, these, we, the dogs are also a, a very good um, host defence uh, mechanisms because they can bark and bite. So you've got to have a very early, uh, important early warning system that's going to protect you uh, by alerting the security and also eliminating those viruses at a very early point before they've gone through multiple rounds of replication. So some very um, acutely um, active um, 
innate sensing is important. And um, if I give you an analogy, so you, you, I'm standing here talking and talking, and uh, so you can, you can hear me, uh, you can see me, and, and maybe even someone in the front row can smell me. So, um, and so you get, much, you get all sorts of information about me being here at the front, and the dogs are the same, so they, they don't necessarily, they're not able to necessarily recognise the individual styles of members of the, um, uh, the grouping from, from which I come, the, the um, Emerging Infections Institute, um, but they can recognise that there's somebody there making a noise. So, uh, and, and these are really important, and from what, what we know about hep C, this is a very, very dominant mechanism. The, uh, the innate response, according to the genetics, seems to play a predominant role in determining your outcome, and actually we harness that for treatment. So, although it's uh, a very complex form of treatment, we basically just boost people's interferon, which is their innate response, um, and hope to clear them of the virus, although it's very partially successful. But the, 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 the point is, as I said, the viruses are usually smart enough to evade these innate systems, so you need a specific system, and that's where the vaccination comes in. So, but the, specific, the specificity means that they have to be perfectly targeted towards the virus, so they can't, you can't have uh, lots of security teams already waiting there for every single virus you might come across. But you have an embryonic one, so you, all of you have got immune responses against uh, HIV that you might never have seen, or hepatitis C that you've never seen, or viruses we haven't even heard of yet. They're all, they're, all those cells are there. They just need to be amplified in order to protect you, but that takes a little bit of time. So, um, and just finally on this uh, extended uh, analogy before it just finally peters out. So what, what are the cells going to do? You've, got, you've basically got three kinds of cells. So you've got antibody-making cells. Most people have heard of those. And what those will do is sweep up the, the virus as it's in the environs, in the, in the, ball, the, the corridors... Of, of the palace or in the grounds. Um, but they can't do much about the virus that's already in the rooms. And so in order to do that, to, to break that cycle where the virus is, is starting to expand, you need um, cells to go and knock on the doors of those rooms and clear out the virus. And they can either basically just trash the room um, by torching it. And so you, you lose the virus, but you uh, also lose the room. Or you can... Um, uh, essentially kind of fumigate it and, and get the virus out and protect the room. So there, there are various subtleties to the whole process, but it needs the virus to go in, specifically recognise an infected cell in this case, and clear it out. And so that's the form of immunity that, that's really important in these viruses, and that's the one we've been trying to boost. That's not easy, and there is no example yet, really, that, of this working. So it's a matter of faith that this is going to uh, work. But we've got reasonable evidence, which I don't think I'm going to dwell on a lot, that this is a natural process that's happening and we're trying to amplify it. So, the killer T cells, those are the ones that are doing the, the, the room investigation. So I thought I'd show you a little video. Um, and if we can get the lights down a little bit, is that gonna upset the, the filming? So, this is a, a target cell, and this is a, a killer T cell. It's actually one of mine which is still alive, growing in a lab in Cambridge. And that's a, a tumour cell, which is not one of mine, which has been killed by this. And what you can see, uh, hopefully everybody can see, that this cell doesn't look very happy. It's got bits blebbing off it, um, and it's condensed its nucleus. That's the act of killing. Um, I'll just go back and see if we can get that one again. It's so good, you've got to see it twice. And here, here the, you can see these little red granules, and essentially they're all localising at, at an interface between these two cells, and actually some of them passing into that cell, and they're, they're responsible for the cell death. So we've got this process going on in us all the time. These, these um, cytotoxic T cells are able to go around, and we're all full of viruses and things that, um, that uh, you're, you're totally unaware of that, that are being contained exactly by this process. So, but, of course, it's the cell death involved, so it has to be very, very tightly regulated. So the system's in really tight balance. So, you, again, if you're going to make a vaccine, you have to make sure that you overcome this and target it towards uh, the virus of interest. So it's not that easy. So, right, on to the, the main topic. So hopefully everybody understands the, the background. So this is a map of, of, of hep C, uh, global epidemiology. It's not, as you can imagine, for all these sorts of surveys, it's not actually that easy to get good information about all parts of the world. And there's a technical issue with the test, which sometimes can be uh, false positive in, in areas where there's a lot of other sorts of infection going on, like malaria, because uh, your serum, serum becomes a little bit sticky 
Uh, but generally, we, we think there's a lot of it about, and there's very good evidence for some of these hotspots. And as I already mentioned, Egypt. So what we think has been happening with hep C is it's been in human populations, although I'm in the Institute of Emerging Infections, actually hep C has been in human populations for hundreds, if not thousands of years. It's just really emerged as a problem in the last uh, few decades. But the, um, it, it was probably born, at least many strains are evident in Africa. Africa, you can find the biggest diversity of hep C. Um, so, and it's, if you look uh, through molecular clock approaches um, in Africa and Asia, you can see that these things have diversified over a long period of time. But in, in Egypt, you find basically one very dominant strain, and if you put the clock on that, it looks like it all emerged sometime 60, 70 years ago, and along the Nile. And if you look at the groups of people who were ex potentially at risk along the Nile, they're um, of, or, all of an age, and it sort of drops off, um, it, well, at least it, right, the incidence uh, rises, the prevalence rather rises as, as people get older. So um, what appears to have been the case is there was a schistosomiasis eradication campaign going on along the Nile. Schistosomiasis is a parasitic disease which is very prevalent there. And the treatment that was being given was parenteral, in other words, with a needle. So people were lined up and the virus was, this one set of many viruses that were circulating got hugely amplified at that time. And, and the, the, the spread is not that easy for hep C outside the kind of environment of a needle. But because there's so much, and we're talking 20 or 30% in some populations in Egypt, um, it's spread out into households, it's spread into children, it's got everywhere. Um, and we think that probably, although it's very well documented in Egypt, we think that probably if you look in, in other areas, we've got a little bit of evidence for a cohort effect in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in other hotspots, um, that, and certainly um, very likely in, in South Asia, there's a particular genotype which is hugely dominant there, um, that, that, that medics or allied health professionals in some way have, have basically spread some, at least responsible for some of the early spread of these viruses, not, not all of it by any means. So these are some of the patients that, that, that we see in clinic in Oxford. Um, they're, they're not, it's not a very high profile disease in, in many ways, but um, it does sort of reach prominence. Um, Pamela Anderson's here. She, she has been in the press talking about her hep C a little bit, and uh, you can see her boyfriend here is very heavily tattooed, and, and it's, she's sort of alluded that it may be a, a tattooing that, that spread the hep C, but most of these other folk have experimented with IV drugs at some point and they've used needles. He's from ZZ Top. I think it's this chap from the Chili Peppers. And I sometimes I forget who all the other guys are, but he's Alan Ginsberg, who's a big poet. So there was a period, and it's obviously there still is, but there's a period in some of these people's lives where they may have injected. The, the risk of, of, of acquisition of hep C through needle injection in these highly, um, uh, in these IV drug using communities where there's a lot of sharing of equipment going on is incredibly high. Um, so if you look in cross-sectional uh, studies, 60-70% of them might be infected. Um, so just a single exposure um, may be sufficient. Um, and then once you've, it, once you've been exposed, it's the, the point about the virus is it can set up long-term carriage, not in every case, but in the majority of cases. So that's why it's led us with this problem, and, and some of these folk are coming to present with disease decades down the line. So what happens is, if, you, if you're infected through your, let's say, your needle use or blood transfusion, blood products, or, or these medical interventions in, in Egypt, there are some people who clear the infection on their own, and um, the, these killer T cells we think are very important. This, the helper cells, or T cells in general, these room viewing cells. But most people go on to persistent infection, and then a fraction of those are going to get progressive disease, which means that their liver ultimately becomes highly fibrosed, uh, fails to produce the proteins it requires and goes on to develop cancer. So that's a guesstimate of about 20% every 20 years, but we don't know for sure. Some people actually carry the disease without really too much problem. In fact, they're rather surprised when it's picked up um, and um, they feel fine. And if you look back uh, in some studies, people will, um, you, you can sort of estimate the overall impact of, of hep C. And, and so um, in, in many populations, it's not doing a lot, but it's the, this group um, is, a, is a huge problem and it's an emerging problem because of the kind of, a time, as time goes on, um, it's the commonest indication for liver transplantation, the commonest cause of liver failure in, in many Western populations. Um, you've got to add in a few other things that might contribute, like alcohol, of course. Um, but certainly, th this is a problem, but you just have to take it as maybe the tip of an iceberg, really. It's not, I've written it as two separate populations, but it's a continuum here. 
the thing that makes us encouraged to, to, that we can work with the vaccine is that we know that people will clear the infection. So um, it, it's actually quite rare, although there are 170 million people globally with the disease, it's actually quite rare to catch them in acute disease because it's not very aggressive. But we know that people go on to clear it. And so we think that if we can just encourage them down this pathway with the vaccine, uh, we'll be doing them some good. You could argue, and I think this is a point that people might raise later, that we'd be better to stop them getting it in the first place. Uh, rather than just wait for them to get it and then use some kind of clever bit of immunology to fix it. Um, and I think that's true. It, it, everything has to be taken together. You, it, we're not going to get rid of hep C just with the vaccine, uh, but it could be a component of that. So what we're aiming to do, basically, if you go back to this analogy, is to make sure that our security force um, back at base is, is already trained. So it doesn't have, the virus doesn't have a huge advantage, and so that as soon as the first dog barks in the, uh, uh, in the palace... Um, there's a whole set of these killer T-cells can come flooding out um, and, and nail the thing before that you get this upslope of, of viral replication. So here's a, I think this is pretty much the only technical slide, but um, this is the inside of hep C. So if you remember, I showed you there was a, basically the virus has got an outside bit and an inside bit. And the outside bit would be very attractive as, as a target, but the problem is it's incredibly variable. It's, uh, it's, a, it's much, much more variable than HIV, which I'll come to. And that, that's in itself way more variable than influenza, which everybody knows is quite a troublesome virus to pin down. But the inside is much less variable, and it's a really good target for T-cells. So that we pick this bit, um, and um, we, we already know that, um, that, that, that immune responses to this are associated with, with good outcomes. So we're, we're happy with that. But we're unhappy in some ways, because we could only pick one. And we already know that, all, um, if you look at all the global diversity of hep C, we're actually targeting the European version or the American version, and we're not targeting the, many of the African versions and the, and the Asian versions. And what, what's been done, and this wasn't all us, we just involved a later stage, is to mix it, um, uh, is to deliver the, you need to basically encourage the immune system to, 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 to target that, those, those particular hep C proteins. And we're using a chimpanzee um, virus to carry the, the information in. And the chimpanzee viruses and the human virus, interestingly, are very, very similar. Um, and they have what's called an adenovirus. For us, an adenovirus is usually a very trivial illness. It causes a cold or a very minor illness. Um, but the immune system is hugely trained against these. So it, it, if you get um, an adenovirus carrying something else and you, you produce a fantastic immune response, they're, they're very much stronger than most other things. So... Um, but the, chimpan the reason we're using a chimpanzee one is we won't have seen it before, so there's no prior immunity to that. So this is a kind of sneaky way of kind of getting past the immune system and then encouraging it to, to respond. So that's the trick in the trial. And so what we've been doing, and this is work with Ellie Barnes, who's now got her own uh, senior fellowship and is also a member of, of the, the Martin School, um, is set about trying to... Um, understand what the consequences of this sort of immunization will be and this is where I think the ethics starts to wind up a bit because uh, so far it seems sort of obvious that you might want to make a vaccine that doesn't seem very complicated but um, if we we've now let's imagine that we've got a, 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 a vector that, that you think is safe you then have to attract volunteers <coughs> into the trial um, and volunteers basically in this case are not going to benefit from this, we, we've only got a very early phase product, so they have to be encouraged to do this or for, for, for the greater good, essentially, as, as I understand it. Um, and what we're going to be doing is, is, is trying to design the trial so it's as safe as possible. There are a lot of safeguards built into this so that you don't have the same problems that people have had, very high profile problems in Norfolk Park. So the primary outcome is safety, but of course, what you really want to know is if you're inducing immune responses. And I should point out that just making the immune response doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be immune. That's a very different thing. So we can make these immune responses, but we won't know at the end of this whether it's really working until you challenge people. So there's no way on earth, and I don't think it's, it's not really an ethical question at all, you're not going to be able to challenge people with hepatitis C um, and see whether these immune responses work. You're going to have to design studies which allow you to test that idea in real life. Um, so I'll just give you a smidgen of what we've found, and this is just like one slide of hundreds of slides that we've generated from these trials. Um, 
And what these are, these are the killer cells. These, these clouds of, of cells are killer cells that are specific for one tiny part of hep C. So you've got to imagine there are lots of these all lined up together. And don't worry too much about the individual things, but you can measure a lot of the qualities of these cells. It's the size of the response is, is really quite huge, actually. This is uh, about one in, perhaps one in 10 of your T cells is directed against this one peptide from hep C. Um, what we're interested in are these. If you remember back to that video I showed you with the little red dots uh, targeting the, 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 uh, the cancer cell, or was it just a target cell, and killing it, um, those dots contain granzyme B. And so if they've got granzyme B in it, it's, this is a, a killer molecule. And so we, we're, we're pretty confident that these would kill an infected cell. Um, so we, we, can, we can infer a lot from these trials, but I think you know, we're missing the essential bit of information is, to, is whether they really work. So that, that's the paper that came out about this time last year with um, a huge number of authors, some of whom are in the room. Um, and I don't, I'm not really asking people to read it, it's just that's the, that's the kind of result of all that effort which took many years, uh, firstly to understand what the T cells were doing and then to harness that information to try and um, uh, generate a vaccine. So, but this is really the first step on the road. And it's the next bits, I think, that are going to be the more interesting bits because uh, actually if you look around Oxford, there are a lot of people doing this sort of thing. It's not, it's not actually at this stage of kind of immunology, it's not now so difficult to generate these T cell responses. Um, but it's really the question is whether they're going to work. And with hep C, we got, a, we got, as I said, we know that T cells can do the job. So that gives us some encouragement. But we've got to try and make sure that we... Um, deal with the virus. It's essentially um, like Kevin Spacey in, in The Usual Suspects, which I hope everybody's seen. Uh, it was a fantastic film. But essentially, he can ma he'll make up whatever uh, disguise is really necessary to, to optimise his escape from, in this case, the police. But in our case, the vaccine. And the virus will then, as soon as the vaccine has turned its back, uh, straighten up and walk off. Um, but I think if we have a multi-pronged approach with the vaccine, I think we can uh, probably pin it down. So I think we're, we're on the right path, but there's no real room for complacency here. So I think the next steps, this is where there may be some discussion, is, is how you then develop trials and safely, ethically, uh, appropriately to trial vaccines. So how, how do you test this in, in a setting where you're relying on people to put themselves at risk to get hep C? Uh, what sort of groups can you, could you have to educate them su sufficiently so that they're aware of the risks of a trial and therefore, uh, and also aware of the risks of hep C without necessarily, but, but still have a trial where people are at risk. And these trials have to be very big because you're looking for an effect in addition to the natural clearance of the virus. Uh, and how are you going to treat people in trials? How are you going to make sure that they then are safely looked after? And, the, and again, these are very vulnerable groups. How do you deal with incentivization for people? Who, the role of funding or how, 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 do, you, how do you generate funding in, in, in a way that's sustainable to get to your best vaccine. Um, and then I think uh, one question that I was pondering over, um, because it's very germane to what we're trying to do next, is when do you move on to the next set of trials? When are you confident that you've really got the best vaccine and for your use of resources? So this is um, just the way I was thinking. So at the moment, we've done a very simple trial, which is based on a conceptual idea of what was going on. Um, and uh, the tools available. So we generated something that looks, you can make those cells with all the right components, but we don't know yet whether those are going to work. But let's say you're, it, it works at least in terms of the criteria that you set and it's safe. You could then go on to phase two, which is exactly what's happened. The, these vaccines pretty much identically to the way they've been tested in phase one, gone into phase two. And a phase two trial is a trial that's looking at efficacy. So that's relying on folk who are putting themselves at risk of hep C that you've identified. You give half of them the vaccine, half of them not the vaccine, um, placebo, and then you see how many of them get chronic hep C at the end. I mean, that, that's not a complicated idea, but it's very difficult to deliver. And in fact, that's a multi-center trial that's going on in the States. But it's our first effort with the vaccine. So if we're lucky, and the, that, that trial is massive, it's gonna run for five years. Um, if it all goes perfectly well, we'll have a vaccine at the end of that which might work in those populations. You'd, you'd know that much. Um, but that we don't know, yet know whether it's basically the best vaccine. So you could have another model. Um, if, it doesn't, if it fails at phase two, I guess what we'll have to do um, is go back to basics and try and improve it. But, and hopefully we'll have some evidence of, to, as to why it's failed. 
bring it back. But from what I can see from the HIV field, where they've got stuck in this a bit, going round and round this loop is not very attractive. People lose heart. The funders don't really see the benefit of doing this unless you've got a very clear rationale for doing it. And it's a lot harder to go around the second time than it is the first time. So you've got a fantastically fair wind in your favour at the beginning, but I think it will get continuously harder um, if you keep falling over at phase two. So you don't want to have to do that too many times. So what you would want to do, and I, I think this is a resource issue and maybe there's an ethical component to it, is invest at this point so that you've got some idea of, of all the different vaccines that are going on which is most likely to work. And then you don't want to go, to avoid going around this loop endlessly, you only take a, a very limited number through um, into phase two with, with a lot more uh, basic uh, understanding of the comparability <coughs> to other approaches. I mean, the, the, there are complications because ideally you'd have what's called a correlative protection. So you'd know that if you got X number of T cells or X level of antibody that you'd be protected, but we don't have that for hep C. So we can't necessarily take it uh, we can't perfect this, but we can, we've got a reasonable idea. So I think that's a kind of area that we're inhabiting at the moment, and I, there are a lot of challenges involved. And because as, as you scale up, everything gets much more expensive, there's a lot more at stake, it's sort of, it, it becomes, all these questions become much harder. I'm going to just talk for the last bit about HIV, and uh, I was encouraged to do this by, um, there's a lot of work going on in the, in the Martin School on HIV, and it's just got to a really interesting point. Um, and John Freiter, I've been discussing this with, I don't think he's here today, but um, he's leading the program on HIV eradication. So, um, uh, and eradication in this sense, what they're primarily looking at is within host. So, getting, if you're infected with HIV, getting rid of it in you. But there's also the kind of broader question of whether we can get rid of it altogether, which sounds mad at the moment, but I'll hopefully, by the end of the talk, maybe think it's a bit less mad. Um, or maybe you think it's still mad, but um, we can have a discussion about it. So why would he even ask this question? Well, uh, as I alluded to, uh, the trials that went into phase two and so forth in, in, in HIV um, didn't really show, uh, for vaccines, have shown some partial efficacy in the very best case, about 60% efficacy, which is not really... Uh, it's good if you're in that loop of trying to improve things, but not anywhere near ready to roll out, and there are problems in, 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 in making progress, and some of the T-cell vaccines have fallen over completely. So there's plenty of room for improvement of those, but at the moment they don't work, and some people think they will never work, although I, I, I'm not sure if that's necessarily true, but it's a very hard ask for a vaccine. We know, on the other hand, that HART, which is the treatment, means highly active antiretroviral therapy, so this is antiviral drugs, which are basically directly inhibiting the machinery of the virus. That works brilliantly. I'll show you a slide. Uh, it stops patients dying. It stops patients feeling ill. But we're left as a question. Is, is, so is this the end of it? So we're just going to give everybody heart. Um, and is it really realistic to give a child heart for the, their entire life? We just don't know what the impact of that's going to be. Um, and they have to keep taking it in a, in a very rigorous way to avoid the complications of treatment of resistance. And we don't know. I mean, just taking any drug, I'm sure all of you find that re relatively hard. This is quite a hard ask, and it's very expensive. And just to go back to hep C for a minute, um, the hep C, as I, hopefully people have now got the idea, you can clear this on your own, and we can hopefully improve that with a vaccine. But HIV, you can, you can sort of control it, but you can never clear it. Um, so what we can, maybe we can do better with HIV is still tip things in favor of the host a bit, um, weaken the virus and promote the host. Um, and what you do with heart is you suppress a virus to what's called undetectable levels. It doesn't really mean it's gone. It's just not detectable in the blood, and the immune system recovers. So that's why you um, have a, a big impact of that. And that one of the questions that jo John and Rodney Phillips have been involved in is, is saying, well, if you do this very early, it's back to my argument about getting on top of the virus quicker. Can you have a bigger effect than doing it later? So we just didn't know. So again, this is a clinical trial setting. Um, you can't answer the question unless you take hundreds of people, give them early therapy or not, and see if it makes any difference. So 10 years later, having asked the question, they produced this paper. Um, so the, the Spartak trial investigators, you thought there were a lot of people in the paper I showed you, the, the vaccine paper, the very large number of people in the Spartak trial. But John and Rodney take a prominent position in this because they did the key immunology experiments. Um, and this has just come out. And... Uh, Basically, 
it depends whether you're a half full, half empty sort of person, but it didn't do, it didn't make a big difference. So you can't sort of knock the virus on the head at the beginning and then you take the, take the um, drugs off and it doesn't come back. That, that would be a really great hope because you pummeled it so hard that it hadn't really got into the right sort of niches. But um, it didn't work. On the other hand, it didn't do any harm. So you could say, well, why not then just treat everybody because uh, we've got the drugs and why would you wait? Um, I mean, if, if you had a diagnosis of HIV and you knew there were drugs available that could improve your immune system, you might say, well, give me the drugs. Why, why are you not treating me? So that's a kind of interesting one. And this is what the uh, editorial said in the New England Journal of Medicine. And they came up with uh, a suggestion that if you're in a resource-rich setting, which I think means the US and maybe bits of Europe, um, possibly not Oxford, so to just give everybody HIV, uh, everybody with HIV <laughs> heart. I'll come back to the treat, the, the, yeah, give everybody uh, tr uh, treatment, just treat everybody. Um, but if you don't have those resources and they're just putting them into two categories, um, you should only treat people where it's proven benefit uh, so that you save the maximum number of lives. So this is a really complicated area to, to get into, I think, um, and, and, and fraught with uh, ethical questions. Um, but I think probably the, the, the net result is that people in resource-rich settings will simply be uh, tested and treated, and if they present acutely, they'll be treated then, and uh, everybody who's HIV positive, regardless of the progression of their disease, will just get treatment. Um, and for the rest of the world, where of course the burden of disease is, they'll have to just take their chance a little bit. Um, so what happens with heart? So you're putting all these guys on heart, uh, and what is a really amazing, especially for those of us who've seen it introduced, is the massive impact of heart. Um, so in the old days, before it was introduced, so we, the drugs were rolling out in the early 90s, but just as ones or twos, and the trick is to put them all together with, with a, a range of different agents. So once enough agents have been generated, you can put them together in a pool, um, and you, that's what this sort of heart is. It's not one set of drugs, it's any, any set of drugs that falls into that category. You, if you didn't really have access to that, the death rate was very significant. If you, you fix it pretty well, and as time's gone on, hearts got better and better, but it hasn't quite reached um, normality. So again, I mean, you're doing pretty well, but not, not perfectly, considering this was really a, a very significant disease. It, it's been a massive impact, it's, 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 it's brilliant. Um, but you're left with a bit of a problem in terms of resource um, and delivery and so forth. So these become population issues. So at the moment, these are the kind of expectations of what we might be spending on um, heart if we're only covering 40% of the people uh, who need it. If you scale up, of course, you spend more money, but it's going to keep going up and up and up. Um, so that's just adding to the issues there that, that, that we're going to be facing with these huge numbers of people. I mean, people will be benefiting from it, but the, the actually delivering all this is very complex. So that's, uh, that was a statistic that John dug out. But I thought this was quite an interesting one, and I'll just finish with it. So um, instead of uh, just waiting for people to come to you, test them, and then just accumulating people who've, who've acquired HIV and then treating them, and, I mean, that would be great if, in itself. Uh, you can do a lot of good that way. Maybe you can do more with the drugs if you can't do it with the vaccine. So what the, this is a model. So what they suggested was what you might be able to do is test everybody. Test everybody. I mean, it's voluntary, but you still have to... You've got a very broad sweep. Um, and then treat everybody. So you can successfully treat people. And we, we know, importantly, that if you treat them, you can stop them transmitting as well as helping their own disease. Um, you have to be a little bit careful with this because a lot of the spread is happening in very early stages of disease. So uh, at the, the, the folk that were in that Spartak trial are the most likely to spread the disease on. And so they, they kind of wondered, if you went really... Um, very aggressively into this and started to treat people um, as, a, as a huge population, whether you could then like, turn the tide with this. And this, I'm, I'm not, um, uh, it's quite a complicated paper, but I think this is probably the ish, the main bit of the graph to look at. So essentially, what we're doing at the moment is we're playing a bit of catch up, and, and actually, we'll be expanding numbers of people on, on heart, which would be good in many ways. 
but unsuspe possibly unsustainable. But if you if you go and 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 and, uh, and and start treating beyond that, maybe you can stop the spread, and then the numbers of people on heart, in according to this model, would start to go down. And the mortality, obviously, I mean, the treatment itself is going to be good, but then the numbers would start to go down because you'd be stopping the transmission, and so the whole thing might just condense down to a much smaller problem. And that sounds really interesting, um, but I don't know whether it's going to actually be possible to drive that forward. Uh, that paper's only recently come out. So is it, is it really feasible to, to do this if you had the political will, if you had the kind of ethical framework to do it? Is it, is it reasonable to go around uh, test, uh, asking everybody to get tested and, and then put them on treatment when they basically feel well and don't want to go to the doctor? Um, and then this is a, these are more uh, to do with resources. I mean, actually, if you have a relatively... Uh, there's, a, there's a fixed pot of money in some ways. Um, if you just spent all your money on uh, a therapy program, would that mean that we would never get a vaccine? Which I think most people agree would be a good thing uh, to have a vaccine. Um, what John's working on is, 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 a, is, is, if, is taking individual patients and trying to eliminate the virus in those people so they would not need heart and would not spread the virus. That's very aggressive treatment. So you're taking somebody who's got the potential for um, a reasonable <coughs> lifespan if they keep taking the tablets, and you're going to put them through something that's more like cancer therapy to try and eliminate this last little tiny bit of virus. And, and that model of, of taking everybody and treating them and getting rid of it, it is just a model. But could you actually design a trial, an ethical trial, that would um, allow it to be tested, and then in, even in a, in a contained way, so that you could take it forward? Otherwise, it's just going to stay as a nice paper in the Lancet, but not change anybody um, for the better. So I should thank everybody, and um, particularly the Martin School have been funding this. All my friends and colleagues at the Peter Medwar Building, these are the PIs in the, in the, in the Martin School. Uh, I'm, otherwise, my salary is funded through the, MR, uh, the Wellcome Trust um, and the BRC. Thanks very much. Uh, all right, well, uh, open up for questions in uh, just a moment. I just wondered if I could... Uh, kick things off by uh, asking a question about the ethical uh, dimension of the hepatitis C stuff that you were talking about. Yeah. So I suppose in the early days of, of, um, of clinical trials, we had a number of ethical disasters. And the most famous one is probably the Tuskegee trial of syphilis, some of you may know of, uh, which was carried out in America. And the control group uh, who had syphilis were basically, it was a longitudinal trial in for many years, and they were allowed to kind of sicken and, uh, and die, uh, and they weren't told by the, uh, by the uh, researchers when uh, effective treatment became available. Uh, and, you know, this is now seen as a kind of a moral atrocity. So what we have now are these rules that in order to enrol somebody in a clinical trial of any kind of uh, medical treatment, uh, you have to offer them benefits that are in line with the risks of, of participation. Now, I suppose... It's, it's quite interesting when you think about that uh, for preventive medicine, like a vaccine. You know, what kind of benefit can there be? Well, there can only be a benefit if there is some kind of risk of you getting uh, the disease. So you, you think, well, if, if I want to run a phase two trial in humans of a vaccine, what I really need is a population of people who are at some risk of getting the disease. And what we saw in your uh, map uh, for hepatitis is that there's not very many places where that's the case. Uh, well, it's concentra I think that's, a, that, that the, that's an average, so it's right. really concentrated in some groups within those countries. Right, but it's concentrated as is uh, HIV, I suppose, in, in, in areas that are poorer, sort of less developed countries. Uh, so to really confer a benefit uh, by putting people on a trial vaccine, you have to kind of carry out the, the trial, to better to, at least, to carry out the trials in those areas. But then you open up... Uh, 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 different kind of criticism, which is that, you know, here is this wealthy country that will be able to afford to give everybody uh, the treatment once it's available, and you're using as your kind of test subjects people in this country that won't be able to benefit from the vaccine. So I just, I thought it'd be good to get you just to talk for a couple of minutes to that point, yeah. and, and just, you know, how does that impact on your work? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's something we're thinking about a bit, um, and there's an extra element of complication, because the viruses that are circulating in developing countries, uh, including Egypt, 
are slightly different from the ones that are circulating in the West. So at the moment we're developing a, vir a vaccine which we hope will cover everything, but actually is designed against the, the Western virus. Um, and you, I, I, I think the, the, there's, a, there's a sort of practical element of difficulty. The, the first trial that's, the, the first trials that, that have gone on have gone on in the US. And the, these are in uh, very well characterized IV drug using populations. So if you take an IV drug using population, as I said, there's already a very high level of hep C in those just because of the, however, you uh, kind of, the, however they're, they've been, uh, have access to needles and so forth, uh, um, there's they're still a fairly high level. But what's actually, what the people that you need are the ones who've been, uh, been exposed to hep C and haven't yet acquired hep C yet. Um, so you have to not only have the group, but you have to have a very well organised set of individuals, very, so very well characterised. And they, they don't, as you're pointing out, they don't exist in very many places. So in fact, it's going to be concentrated in, in a group in San Francisco and in a group in Baltimore. I mean, these are probably, although this is a very rich country, these are probably the real absolute poorest folk, folk there. So I think your issue still applies. Um, the, but the, it might be slightly different from the... And then there might be another element that's slightly different from the sort of way you framed it, in that um, we, we might not need hep C as a kind of universal vaccine like we do for many other things, and maybe HIV would be different, but hep C is still a relatively restricted group of people who are likely at risk. Um, and, yeah, if it was a perfectly safe vaccine and, and very affordable, um, yes, you could probably have mass vaccination, but probably we'd be targeting it in groups at risk anyway, um, so, so there, there is some kind of benefit that's a bit more obvious there. Um, and there are some people who take the view that um, because it's such a small and very obvious group of folk who are getting hep C in the West, it's not so obvious in the developing world what's happening, that you don't even need to invest any money in making a vaccine. You could just focus on these people. You could treat them if necessary. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that's the case, and I think that's a, the reason it's not the case is because we, we can't do that in developing countries. Um, the, the obvious place to do the trial would be Egypt, because there's so much about and it's spreading in through the groups, but, but there are just a lot of practical issues there. there. There are some very dedicated physicians in Egypt who are trying to create cohorts of the similar type to the one I just described in Baltimore and so forth. But. Um, I'm not sure uh, it's got to quite to the same level. And if you do a trial which is a bit underpowered or you know, recruitment is not good, you've, you've really blown your big chance. So I'm not quite sure where we're going to get to. <coughs> okay, so 